This video looks at some numerical examples of using a T-filter. Previous videos showed how a T-filter modifies the prediction and hence the underlying GPC control law. So this video is going to demonstrate the impact of this change on a number of examples. We're going to use MATLAB code to find predictions, the control law, and give some simulation comparisons with and without a T-filter, and also plot some of the sensitivity functions. First example then, we're going to take a simple system G with some arbitrary choices of control horizon, output horizon and um, control weighting. So there's the system G and you'll notice in particular we've given a simple T filter. Now these are the sorts of pieces of code that you might want. When we did simple GPC we had this code MPC underscore PREDMAT to find the prediction matrices. If you want to do a T filter we've provided a piece of code MPC underscore pred t filt and you'll notice it takes as its inputs hp and q which you've got from the previous file but it also requires the t filter having got the prediction matrices you can either find the control law for straightforward gpc that's mpc law and in fact you can use an identical piece of code to find the parameters when you have a t filter but the difference is you put in these PT and QT rather than P and Q. And finally, if you want to find the closed loop poles, you'll see that you can use PC and <coughs> PCT, and you'll see how they come from these putting in an A, a B, NK, and DK, so your model parameters and your controller parameters. And similarly, there's a file MPC poles underscore T filter because the closed loop pole polynomial calculation is slightly more complex there and you now need AB, NK, NKT, DKT and also T filt. OK, let's go and look at this file and see how it works. Now, it's example one. So you'll notice at the start we put in the A and B parameters, we define the T filter and that's all bookkeeping. You'll find there's two files there which I can just run to find the prediction matrices exactly as in the presentation. Two files I can do to find the control law parameters, exactly the same as before. Take only the first row because that gives you delta UK and then finally these two commands to find the closed loop poles. And then what I'm going to look at is the roots of these two pole polynomials. So if we go to the command window, and that's what you'll notice is interesting, you will see something's gone wrong there. So I'm just going to run that file again, just to make sure. Ah, oh, yes, I forgot to update the A and B. That's what it was. So you'll see, if you look at PC, there are the closed loop poles. If you look at PCT, you'll see it's got the same closed loop poles and an additional pole at 0 0.8. And that additional pole, if you go back, you'll notice has come from the T-filter. And that's what we did in the previous video. Different example then, just for completeness. And you'll notice here I've got a more complicated G of Z, NU, is bigger and y is bigger but also t is now a quadratic rather than a single terms so it's just slightly more complicated but otherwise it's equivalent so if we go to video example 2 all the lines of code are the same except you'll see we've got these different uh, parameters at the start so if I run the whole of that and then go and have a look at what we get what you'll see here's the roots of PC OK, now let's look at the roots of PCT. And what again do you notice? The same roots and two extra roots which match the roots of the T-filter. So that's what we said we expected in the previous video. Tracking performance then. The next file shows a simulation with a set point change, but, and this is critical, no disturbances and no noise. So in other words, we're doing the nominal case. And what we want to find is, does adding this T-filter actually change the nominal responses? And we expect that it should not, even though the controller parameters are different. So here's the file, example three. If we open up, there's example three. 
And what you'll notice, we've got a single model down there. There's my choice of T filter. Here's all my weights and things. Here's my reference disturbance and noise. So this follows on from similar files that we showed earlier in this series. And here's the two simulation files. We've got MPC simulate, no constraints. So that does GPC without a T filter. And MPC simulate, and you see underscore T filt underscore no constraints. So that does the simulation if you include a T filter. So there's a very subtle change. If you look at the call statements, you'll see the only difference is this second one adds a T filter in. But otherwise, they're equivalent files. So let's run those and see what we get. And what do you notice? Blue plot GPC, dashed red plot GPC with a T filter. And you can see there's no difference between them. So Adding the T-filter has not changed the nominal behavior. And if you don't believe me, you can take this code, you can change the A, change the B, you can change the horizons, and you'll see adding the T-filter does not change the nominal behavior. Disturbance rejection, then. The next file shows a simulation with a set point change followed by a step disturbance, but we're not going to have any noise because we want to look at each facet of the uncertainty one bit at a time. So we're just going to look at the disturbance rejection. And what you will see is now, because we're dealing with uncertainty, whether you have a T-filter or not makes a big difference to the responses, because the T-filter affects how uncertainty goes into the predictions and therefore affects the control law um, in terms of its sensitivity. Ironically, what you will notice is the T-filter has actually made things worse. So this is example four. So if we go here to example four, and what do you notice? We've got a simple model, we've got a simple T-filter, simple tuning parameters, and here you'll see the disturbance is no longer zero, but the noise is zero. And again, same as the last file, we're just going to run GPC and GPC with a T-filter. So if I run that file, and here's my two plots. Now, what do you notice? When we look at the tracking performance, which is over here on the left, they're the same. The inputs are the same, inputs are the same, the outputs are the same. But when the disturbance hits, you see this graph here shows you where the disturbance hits roughly at sample 20. You see that GPC rejects the disturbance quicker and with a much smaller overshoot than GPC with a T filter. And if you look at the corresponding inputs, again, you see there's a noticeable difference in the increments over here. So we get a different response for disturbance rejection, and if anything, the T-filters made things worse. Again, you can edit the file to do some examples of your own. What about noise rejection then? So now what we'll do is we'll have no set point change, because that confuses the issue, and no disturbance, and we'll just look at adding noise and see what happens with and without a T-filter. So this one is example 5. So we'll go to example 5. And I won't go through all the code again. You'll see it's equivalent. I'll just run it. And this is what you get. And you'll notice GPC in blue and GPC with a T filter with a red dashed line. And if you look at the outputs, you'll see the blue output much worse than the uh, red output. And if you look at the inputs, you'll see the red input increments very small, the blue input increments quite large. And again, the same sort of picture for the absolute input. Both have the same noise signal. So we're basically simulating them under equivalent scenarios. And you can see that adding a T-filter has given great improvement to noise rejection. So again, you can experiment with changing the choice of T-filter or changing the parameters of A and B or changing the horizons. And you will see similar impacts no matter what you do. And finally, sensitivity functions. We might want to actually plot the sensitivity functions. So normal GPC, we had a sensitivity function like this. With the T-filter, we had a sensitivity function like this. So why don't we just plot the Bode diagrams and see how they compare? And that's in example 6. So if I find example 6, there it is. And I just run it. There's two figures here. So you can see input sensitivity to noise for different T. So the blue line has a T of 1, in essence no T. The red line, you can see the T parameters, it's basically 1 minus 0.8 Z inverse squared. And the green line, 1 minus 0.8 Z inverse. So what you notice 
is as you get stronger filtering, the high frequency sensitivity goes down. No T, you're very sensitive. T with just one pole, you're not as sensitive. T with two poles, sensitivity improved even more. So you can see very clearly putting these blow diagrams that the T filter is helping with the sensitivity to noise when noise is going to be all at the high frequency end which is this end of the bow diagram. Now what if we look at the output sensitivity to disturbances and you see we're getting the opposite picture. Here we find that at the low frequency end, which is where disturbances are going to dominate at the low frequencies, no T filter, the sensitivity is much smaller than with a weak T filter, which is the green, and a strong T filter, which is the red. So you've got to weigh it up. What's most important to you? Is it the low frequency rejection with disturbances, or is it the high frequency rejections with noise? So in summary, a T-filter changes the loop sensitivity and the control law parameters, but not the nominal behavior or nominal pulse. The actual impact is difficult to discern in advance, but typical explanations are stronger filtering reduces the input variance for high frequency noise, but stronger filtering can also make disturbance rejection slower. Experience usually shows that a T-filter helps. Most people would say if you're using a Creamer model, you are going to have to use a Creamer filter, because a, a T-filter, because otherwise your noise rejection is just not good enough. But proposals in the literature for systematic design are relatively weak. And a typical suggestion is to choose the filter poles to match the dominant open loop poles of the system and in fact you can show that gives you sensitivity pretty much equivalent to doing DMC based on step response models. Some remarks for convenience and transparency the examples in this video are all single input single output but the same concepts and insights will carry over to the multi variable case but clearly the coding and the plotting will be somewhat more cumbersome. The requirement for a T filter is closely allied to the fact you've used a Karima model for your predictions. The Karima model is really best suited to the CISO case anyway. So if you've got a multivariable case, you may find alternative ways are best for dealing with uncertainty.